And then one day, again, like, and I'm telling you, it was like a light bulb in my head comes on. And God spoke to my heart. And he said this, he said, Robin, are you going to believe what you've taught for the last 30 years or not? Welcome to the Weird Christian Podcast. I am your host, Samuel Delgado, and this is episode 14. I interview Robin Bertram. Robin is an author, speaker, and former host of the nationally syndicated TV program, Freedom Today. In this episode, we talk about her book, No Regrets, and how God healed her of ALS or Lou Gehrig's disease. But truly, God began his work of healing in her many years before her diagnosis. God healed her of severe anxiety. God healed her son of Lake Perthes. God gave her a ministry which focused on healing and deliverance after calling her away from her career as an optician to know him. Through all of this, God had prepared her to deal with the deep spiritual war for her very life. Of course, she was able to overcome through faith in the one who gives life. We talk about healing, how God calls us to love like he loves us, and many more miraculous stories. So, with no further ado, let's get weird. Um, but go ahead and start by telling us a little bit how you grew up and how you came to know Christ. Well, um, Samuel, I grew up in a Christian home. My father was a pastor for 50 years. Wow. Um, so I grew up on the uh, pew bench in the church. <laughs> mm-hmm. But like everyone, we each have to find Jesus yeah. and salvation on our own. Yeah. So I was about 13 years old. We had been... Um, at a hymn sing in Watermelon Park, Virginia. I was 13 years old, and I remember that night vividly. Um, The overwhelming realization that God was my father. And so as a 13-year-old child, I gave my life to the Lord at that point. Um, I started to really um, learn on my own. Um, in my early twenties, I, when I was in college, I kind of, um, took my own path Mm -hmm. and walked away. Wasn't really as involved in church. Sometimes I would go, sometimes I wouldn't. And when I first started to, uh, realize that I needed God, I started having panic attacks as a young woman. And those panic attacks were pretty severe to the point where I didn't want to leave my home. Um, If I would take something like an aspirin, I thought, oh, it was going to kill me. I mean, so I was really struggling with panic attacks. And then I remember, Samuel, one day I sat in um, in my front yard of my home in Virginia, and I, I took my my Bible outside with me to read that day. And I just grabbed onto that Bible and I held it so close to my heart. And I said, God, I know you have all the answers. Wow. And so I started reading that day and I ran across the scripture that says, perfect love casts out all fear. Yeah. And I remember thinking at that very moment, I had grown up believing that Uh, fear was just part of my personality. It's just who I was, you know, it was, it was part of me. And so I really didn't realize I had a problem until the panic attack started. And when the panic attack started, I had gone to visit my general practitioner and he said, well, we can, we can try some medication and see what happens. I did it for like three days. And I said, this is not the answer. And so when I held that Bible, I knew God had the answer waiting for me. I read that scripture and I'm t- it was like a light bulb came on. It was like almost immediately. And I do mean immediately, the fear left me. Wow. It was like it could not stay where truth now resides. Wow. And so I was radically healed of severe panic attacks from one scripture. 
And when God, you know, I had read that before in the Bible, but it didn't hit me, you know, (laughs) I didn't make the connection. (laughs) And so when God really showed me in that one scripture that he was perfect love and he cast perfect love casts out fear and fear has to do with punishment and God really made that scripture become alive to me and when he did I was healed that set me on a journey and I would sat I would sit in my in my home and read the scriptures two three four hours a day every day because I was so overwhelmed at what God had done he had healed me wow. on his own by myself in my in the privacy of my own home from something that could have destroyed my life. Yeah. So from that point on, I really dug into scripture and I realized there's a lot here I need to understand. (laughs) Yeah. So that sets you on your journey. I like to read that verse. Actually, I I have that in in my notes here. It's uh, first John 4, 18, such love has no, this is the new uh, living translation. Uh, such love has no fear because perfect love expels all fear. If we are afraid, it is for fear of punishment. And this shows that we have not fully experienced his perfect love. Um, perfect. That, that's, that's incredible. And uh, it, it's, it's amazing to hear that in your testimony to see how God uses his word to speak to us. And I've experienced that as well. And I'm sure many of our listeners where you, you read a verse and you've read it countless times. But for whatever reason, um, it it hits different um, in, in a certain context, and, and certainly um, in in your desperation. And I, I know I, I'm using that word because I know um, you were probably at at the end of your rope, and you're probably uh, exhausted and, and, and tired and um, worn out from this. Um, and, and God used his word. That's that, that was the mechanism he used to, to bring about that change and to, to show you truth. It was truth that, that, that sets you free. So that, that's such an incredible uh, testimony. I love that. Um, and then from there, so now you're, you're just soaking up his word for, for two and three hours uh, a day. Tell me a little bit more uh, about that. Um, wh- what is it? Cause that's, that's pretty radical. Uh, you know, I think <laughs> most people you know if, if they if they open up their bible just for five minutes a day they're feeling pretty good about themselves um you know two or three hours uh you know tell me a little bit more about that well you know i really i was like i said i was just so overwhelmed that god healed me from one scripture and i i thought it it, it really set in my heart that the word of god is the true path to life and happiness and contentment and wholeness and so I dedicated, I, I was an optician, I managed an optometric practice in Lewisburg, West Virginia for about 13 years. Mm-hmm. And I remember driving home one day from work and I heard in my heart, the Lord say, go home and know me. And now at this point in time, I was already, already saved I knew yeah. God, right, right, right. But I knew when He said that, when He spoke that to my heart, I knew that He meant on a much deeper level. Yeah. And so I um, went home and I told my husband, you know, I really feel like God is speaking to me, telling me in my heart that I should quit my job <laughs> and just really dive in and spend a lot of time. Uh, you know, knowing God, studying his word. And my husband said, you have lost your mind. (laughs) Yeah. Yeah, (laughs) He said, you know, we had just bought, uh, we had just bought our first new home. We had it built. We put in a pool. We had two car payments. You know, we had all this expense going on. And he just thought that, you know, I was hearing things. (laughs) Yeah. Yeah. And it took about a year and Samuel, it, did, it took about a year for him to really believe and understand that it was God's will for my life. Yeah. And um, so I did quit my job. And the month I quit my job and within three month time period, my husband received uh, raises and, and promotions at his work that completely covered 
my salary. And when, when I quit my job, that was like 30 years ago, I was making good money for women at that time. And, but we had recouped almost every penny that I walked away from when I left that job. Then he realized, hey, this really was God. <laughs> wow, but he had to step out in faith you know, until that point, right? Because yes. you quit um, before those promotions came. Absolutely. Yeah. I quit. And then a, a strange thing happened. God started blessing my prayer life in such an unusual way. And I remember when I would pray, it was almost like, it was like, almost like automatically God was answering prayers when I prayed them. It was so strange. And I realized after the fact that my little business card that I carried around had become another type of identity. Hmm. That I, I had grabbed onto that business card. It was like who I was. It was my safety net. It was my right. identity. Hmm. And, you know, God was teaching me that our identity is found in Jesus Christ. And in any other place that we find our identity, we're in error. And yeah. so it was like letting go of that idol. At that time, you know, everybody was, it was yuppies. Everybody was two income families, everybody, the women all, you know, we, we graduated, we went to college, we had a good job. We didn't even think at that time in the circles that I traveled in, you didn't even think about staying home and raising your children. Yeah. You know, it wasn't, it wasn't the thing to do. The thing to do was to work and have a professional career. And, and looking back, Samuel, I learned so much as a young woman about the foolishness of following societal mores, you know, what society calls important or, or puts precedent on, you know, it's so against what God's plan is for the perfect ideal situation for families. And when I, you know, I would watch my little two-year-old girl stand in our, our dining room window as I would pull off from work to go to work and she would be in tears, be watching you, you know, and I would leave her with my mom and my mother loved her and took good care of her. But, but, you know, I thought I had to work, you know, that was that, that's what society was lying to me about. You have to work. You have to be a professional. You have to do these things. And it took God in his sovereignty, in his grace, in his mercy to open my eyes to the truth. No, you don't have to. You know, you can stay at home. You can be a stay-at-home mother. And so being a stay-at-home mother, I, is, I really, when, when, I, when I made that decision, God just, again, blessed me tremendously and, and started answering prayers. And so fast forward about five years later. Let me, let me ask you before, before you move on, because that's sure. um, pretty profound what, what, what you just said. Um, walking away from, a, you know, a very successful career. Um, and you mentioned society and, and, and right now, um, you know, that's, uh, that's looked at as um, sort of the, the, the ideal uh, woman, right? And I, I imagine in my mind, that's what I want to ask you, stepping away, you know, there's reluctancy on your husband's part at first. Uh, what were you hearing from everyone else around you when, when my friends single thought I, they thought I had lost my mind because I had an ideal situation. I had I was my own boss. I was over, uh, like I said, an optometric practice. I had um, free vacations. I had free trips to New York every year. Wow. I, I met with doctors. I, I had a lot of the area doctors would call and ask me for my opinions on things. I had a good circle of uh, peers in the industry that, you know, I, it's a professional life brings a certain amount of satisfaction, especially 30 years ago when that was not, you know, that was, that's when women were really starting to move into um, making themselves well known yeah. as professionals. Yeah. And so all of my friends, all of my friends, and they were all 
they were all going to church Christians, <laughs> you know, yeah. they, they, they all went to church, um, but they, they really didn't understand what I was dealing with as a young woman, you know, and I knew it was God. I knew that I knew that I knew if this was not Robin's idea because as Samuel, when I walked away and I remember uh, throwing my business cards away, yeah. I mourned for like, you know, probably at least two months. Yeah. I, I just mourned the whole, because it was, it was my identity. It was my safety. Net. Yeah, it's such a big part of you. Wow. <laughs> but I knew that it was God. And so even though I had to go through that period of mourning and I mean, crying every day, like, what am I doing? Why am I doing this? You know? yeah, yeah, what you? Knowing, but knowing in my heart that it was God. Yeah. That, now that's such a be beautiful story. And this is post um, him healing you of your anxiety. Yes. And so I think that that ties into you stepping out in faith. I think it, it shows that you made God more of a priority than what had been uh, such a high priority for you in work, success, whatever, whatever you know, you want to call that. And um, that that's pretty incredible. And, and it's, it's amazing to see that that God bless that. Um, all right. So Five years later, you said? Uh. Okay. Well, five years later, I remember um, <laughs> I had been in prayer and, you know, I had two friends that were called into ministry. And I remember I was driving through my neighborhood and, uh, you know, I had my praise and worship going in my vehicle. And, and I remember praying to the Lord and I said, Lord, you know, I'll be behind this ministry or I'll be behind that ministry if you want me you know, sitting at the book table, if you want, <laughs> want me, whatever, you know, um, whatever you need me to do in those ministries. Yeah. Um, for my friends, I said, I'll be behind either ministry, whatever you want. And he said, I want them behind your ministry. And Samuel, it was, that was the first, <laughs> I was like, and I cried. I was like, wait, wait, wait. What do you mean my ministry? Yeah. I didn't want to be in ministry. I grew up seeing the ins and the outs of what that actually meant. And, yeah. it, you know, being a pastor's kid, you know, is a tough row to hoe anyway. It, you know, it's not, it's all, it's not peaches and cream. It's, there's a lot of difficulty. There's a lot of times that you, you know, you, you see your family, your dad's gone a lot. And my father was gone a lot. You know, he planted five churches. He sang in a gospel group. Um, he ministered as a pastor for 50 years. He was always visiting people or praying for people or whatever. Yeah. <laughs> so, you know, I didn't see him a lot. And I knew there was a lot of struggle. I knew there wasn't a lot of reward. It was more struggle then there was reward. Yeah. And as a young woman, I didn't want that either. <laughs> yeah, yeah. But I remember Samuel again, clearly hearing the direction of God in my heart, because that was not something Robin came up with. Yeah. That was something I, that Robin did not want. Again, you, usually what I have found, if you really want to know if it's God or not, if you want it, it's probably you and not him. <laughs> yeah, yeah. If you don't want it, it's probably him. That's an easy marker for me because I really didn't want to be in ministry. And I cried for two days. I mean, I, I shook. I was, I came home that day and I, I mean, I was like, I told my husband, I said, you're not going to believe this. You're not going to believe this. You're not going to believe <laughs> mm. Wow. And, and so from that point on, God started opening doors for ministry. And I, I decided from the very beginning, I said, God, if this is really you, you're going to have to make it happen. I'm not doing anything. I'm going to know that it's you or I'm not doing it. <laughs> yeah. And so that was really the call. I, I, that was my ministry call. Um, and God showed me it was teaching, teaching uh, Isaiah 61, um, uh, where the Lord, the spirit of the Lord is upon me. He, uh, he has called me. And I knew when I read that scripture that day, shortly thereafter, that it was God's will for me to be in ministry. 
uh, to lead women, to be a teacher, to teach in church, to teach in conferences. Uh, wherever the Lord led me, that's where I was going to speak and teach. Yeah. So that was the beginning of my ministry call. Wow. Yeah, that, that's great. Um, it's good to see that, you know, God will stretch us and challenge us. Uh, so I'm, I'm glad, glad you pointed that out because there's, and we see that kind of all through, all throughout scriptures as well. When God calls someone, um, you know, you look at Moses uh, comes to mind. He had that same apprehension um, where he didn't, didn't feel qualified and, and that's okay. Um, you know, I think what your story shows is that um, you just have to answer the call, you know, yes. and, 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 and he, and he shows up. Um, and he's certainly done that um, in your ministry. So I kind of want to get into um, your book, No Regrets. Um, what, uh, what compelled you to, to write? What's the story behind this book? Well, my book, No Regrets, um, uh, Charisma House Publishing published the book. But um, I had been in, min in ministry and media for a while. I was VP for Christian Women in me uh, Media, which is an international Christian organization that pulls together media uh, professionals. And we, we, at the time, we would teach and train um, people in media. And so I had a, a situation that happened to me several years ago. Um, where I had become sick. I had, my daughter was graduating from NC State University in engineering. And I had, we lived in um, Southeast um, Georgia at the time. And I had a lot of family coming in for um, a, a, va a graduation party. And I'd had an issue with my arm. And I had been helping a friend paint her bedroom like a, a week or two before, and I thought I had pulled a muscle. Okay. And my family was there, my sister and my niece, and I, I started to pick up a, a glass at the party, and I, could, I couldn't lift the glass. And my sister said, oh, we are going to the doctor right now. And I said, no, I just pulled a muscle. It's no big deal. My house was filled with people that day. And she yeah. said, as soon as people leave, we're going to the doctor. And so my niece said, yeah, I th I, Robin, I really feel like we should just run by and check it out because that's yeah. weird that you can't do that. And so we did. We ran by uh, urgent care. And the doctor said, uh, th I told the nurse what my symptoms had been. And she kind of left the room in a, a little bit of a panic Oh, wow. And which I thought that was really weird. And I'm, I'm, you know, making jokes about it. You know, I'm thinking this is, I don't know what's going on, but this is weird. And so the, the doctor kind of rushed in the room and he said, you need to get to the hospital like tomorrow. Oh, gosh. And I said, I, I can't, I can't do that. I said, we, w my family, we've already planned, we planned a vacation in Tuscany and my whole family was going and that was part of our celebration for, for graduation. And I said, I can't. I'm going to Tuscany. We're flying out in the morning. And he said, well, as soon as you get back, we need to get you to a neurologist, Robin, because this is, this is serious. He gave me four diagnoses, and um, uh, three of which I thought, I mean, I thought this was, it's all crazy. He's wrong, you know. So... I went to Tuscany for a 10-day vacation, and I came back. In the meantime, they were trying to get me into a neurologist, and the quickest that I could see a neurologist was five months. And so uh, he, the, the urgent care doctor didn't want me to wait, so I took it up on myself, and I called Mayo. Mayo does not accept anyone without you know, uh, their uh, uh, primary care doctor's recommendation yeah. but when I called when I called Mayo and gave them my, my symptoms they said come tomorrow wow. so I thought okay now I know I'm I could be in trouble here yeah. <laughs> so I went to Mayo in Jacksonville Florida and they took they did a two-day investigation did all this tests and measurements and all that sort of thing and 
they took four, three of the diagnoses off the table, and, and that was Lou Gehrig's disease. And if you know anything about Lou Gehrig's um, ALS, it is debilitating with a two-year li two life expectancy. And there's no treatment, there's no medication, there's no healing, there's nothing they can do. They told me, go home and wait. And I said, wait for what? And they said, until it gets worse. And I said, that's all you can tell me to do? And they said, that's all we can tell you to do. And so Samuel, I, I went home and for one month, and I mean for one month, I was in the deepest, darkest depression you can even imagine. I couldn't lift my head. I felt, you talk about hopelessness. Oh, hopelessness had overtaken me. And I couldn't, get, I couldn't get out of bed. I mean, some of the symptoms, like I would be five minutes from my house and I could not find, figure out in my head how to drive home. Like five minutes from my house and I, I, I would be lost. I couldn't figure out how to get home. So it was, uh, the symptoms were severe symptoms at this point in time. It wasn't like it was little things, you know. And this like was I still could, early on, right? So this is just like right after you got the diagnosis. Right. It was, it was, it was, it had started a little bit, but I was like ignoring it because I was so busy. You know how yeah. you just put yeah, things. Push it off push it off. And so, so, but I, when I couldn't find my way home, I knew I was in real trouble, you know? Mm -hmm. So I remember I was doing a, I was doing a media event in Dallas for Christian women in media. And I was on the stage and I was being interviewed and someone asked me where I lived as part of the interview, interview question. And I could not answer them. And so, so the symptoms were very severe at that time. And so they said, just go home and wait. So I went home and this depression just covered me. And I, I wouldn't get out of bed. I wouldn't talk to anybody. I didn't call anybody. I didn't tell anybody. I wouldn't even tell my family. I didn't, everyone lived away from me in Bluffton when I, when I lived there. So I didn't tell anybody what was going on. I told my husband, I don't want you telling anybody. I don't want people's sympathy. I don't want, I don't want anybody to know. I mean, I was just, it was in a terrible place. And then one day I remember I was in prayer because I, I was still praying. I was still you know, I was like thinking, this is, this is the end. My daughter was getting married and I thought in like seven months and I thought I'm not even going to be able to walk down the aisle at my daughter's wedding. Am I ever going to hold my first grandchild? Mm -hmm. I thought, who's going to hang the, who's going to cook the turkey and who's going to put the tree up? You know, I mean, all these weird thoughts were going through my head. And then one day again, like and I'm telling you, it was like a light bulb in my head comes on. And God spoke to my heart. And he said this. He said, Robin, are you going to believe what you've taught for the last 30 years or not? And I was like, yes, Lord. Yes, I'm going to believe. Yes, Lord. <laughs> and it was like, the the heaviness when I said yes Lord it was like that heaviness that darkness that deep deep dark depression left me mm -hmm. and I was like okay it was almost like God said okay get a game plan get up Robin get out of bed and get a game plan yeah. and so I got up out of bed <laughs> and I got my Bible I pulled out my computer and I, I, all the studies that I had done on healing, all the studies that I had done on deliverance, I started just listing scripture after scripture after scripture. And so I printed that out and I, I put it in a folder. Then I got a tape recorder because I didn't know if I was going to be able to talk in, you know, a couple of months, six months or a year. I didn't know, you know, if I'd be able to speak. So I, I, I wrote a prayer and I read that prayer on the microphone, on the little recorder, yeah. so that I could hear myself praying that every day. And I started 
quoting that scripture day after day, that those, you know, hundreds of, of healing scripture, day after day after day, I was would listen to my prayer that was a warfare prayer against a spirit of infirmity, a spirit of illness. And then I would walk through my neighborhood every single day and I would pray out loud. And Samuel, I would have visions. Uh, this is how the devil is so deceptive. I would have visions of myself being paralyzed. And immediately I would say, no, in the name of Jesus, you lying devil, I do not come into agreement mm -hmm. with that vision. And I would have to fight that, that, and I, I knew, I, Samuel, I knew that I knew that I knew that those visions were demonic. Yeah. And that if I agreed with them, I, I was done. You know, it, 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 it wasn't like it was an option. <laughs> it wasn't like I had an option. I couldn't rely on doctors because doctors couldn't do anything about it. Yeah. And so God had put this dream in my heart several years before, and I didn't know what it was about. But my father on his deathbed said this. He said to me, he said, Robin, he said, I have no regrets. Well, when he said that, I was in 40-something, and I remember thinking, how do you have no regrets? I thought, you know, I'm 40-something, and I have, like, truckload of regrets. <laughs> I mean, let me go through my long list of regrets that I had. And I was just, you know, it, it, it so shocked me. And it, I pondered on that for like a year. Yeah. How do you live with no regrets? Yeah. And so after I went through this experience and I was, I was really ill, I, I was still, uh, you know, I was still uh, doing my, uh, my work with the organization that I worked with. We were going to... NRB, National Religious Broadcasters. And I remember I ran into someone at Charisma House and I said, I've got an idea for a book and it's called No Regrets. And so I just shared a little bit of my testimony. And the next day I got a call and they said, would you be willing to sit down with the uh, VP of marketing, which never happens. <laughs> Yeah, <laughs> my uh, my agent said, Robin, this this just doesn't happen to people. I don't know if you realize it, but I knew that it didn't happen. So I said, of course I will. So I met with the VP of marketing at Charisma House. And when I sat down and I just shared my testimony, he said, will you put that in a book? And I said, if you'll publish it. <laughs> <Right>. <laughs> he said, of course I will publish it. <laughs> So that was the birth of no regrets. It based on my father's statement and years of pondering and then facing my own mortality, knowing that, you know, this life comes to an end here. And when it does, what is it going to look like? And Samuel, I remember at my dad's viewing the night before his funeral, and I was, I, my dad and I had become best of friends. And that's a whole nother testimony that's beautiful. But, but I remember being at his funeral and at his viewing and person, just every person came through. And Robin, had it not been for your dad's prayers, our family wouldn't have made it. Or Robin, it, had your dad not showed up when he did, you know, we wouldn't have had electricity or, or just a long list of testimony after testimony after testimony of how my dad had impacted lives. That is stories I had never even heard of, my family had not heard of, that, that people would share with me through the entire night. And that's what a life of no regrets looks like. Yeah. One and, to God. And I learned through that, Samuel, what's most important. I learned through that process of looking at my own, my, my own mortality and, you know, the shortness of life when the word of God says it is but a breath. It truly is but a breath. 
And when it's all said and done, what matters, it's not the house that you live in, it's not the car that you drive, you know, the, it's not the clothes and the jewel, jewelry that you wear. It's what did your life speak into the lives of other people that really matter? It's, it's, it's what you do for your God that really matters. Were you the type of person that said, God, okay, send me. Wh whatever you need me to do, God, just send me. Were you the type of person that was willing to do the things that you didn't think you were qualified for? You didn't think you were trained for. That's the beauty, Samuel, of God. And I, I love what he does. He takes the incompetent and makes us competent. <laughs> he takes the untrained and lets us train others. You know, I mean, he does just such an, an amazing job of using the unqualified so that when it's all said and done, when it's truly God, he gets all the praise, he gets all the glory, and we're not so foolish to think it's anything about us at all. Yeah. And that's truly what No Regrets is about. And when I wrote the book, I, I started out the first chapter sharing um, with people about my about my questions, you know, that I had when I was when I was facing yeah. death. And through it, I've got what's called a um, pillar of abundant living. In yeah. each chapter, you'll find throughout those chapters, scriptures that I held on to when I was facing this horrific disease. Um, and, you know, things that I, I reached out, Tozer is one of my, I just love Tozer. And yeah. so you'll find quotes throughout the scripture. I talk about, uh, in the book, I talk about, um, God encounters. Because, you know, I talked earlier, I mentioned earlier, there's a lot of people that go to church and they're good people and they do good things, but they don't listen for the voice of God. They don't believe he still speaks today yeah. or they think that he does, but it's only through it's only through scripture. And you know, God is so, he's so intimate. He wants us where I am, my sheep will also be. And, and he says, he, he wants us to hear him and he wants us to know that he hears us. Yeah. And that's what intimacy is all about. So part of this book is talking about God encounters along the way, experiences that I had things that really impacted my life early on that brought me to a place of understanding. And this is one thing that I want to share with your audience, Samuel. You know, when I started out as a young woman, I could have gone the, I, my degree is in psychology. So, you know, I'm a believer in psychology. Yeah. I could have gone that route. Yeah, for sure. But thank God I knew through growing up, in a, in a Christian home, I knew that God had the answers. Yeah, absolutely. So, but if I had not listened and read that scripture and opened my heart to receive that day, I could have never gone on and, and done what I've done. Yeah. You know, I mean, God opened a, a national uh, syndicated, nationally syndicated television show for me. I was, I was a, co a host for seven and a half years. I've written numerous books. I've spoke in conferences across the country. I could have done none of that. Absolutely zero. Yeah. Had I not been willing to let the Lord train me and teach me and heal me. Yes. Yeah, you know, um, I'm going to get to, to the book and I have questions on, on it and, and, and your story as well. Um, but uh, yeah, just hearing your story, what really stands out to me is that, you know, and those seeds were planted, I know at a young age um, from, from your father and being around church. Um, but as you said, you had to come into that faith for yourself. And, uh, you know, when the time came, you knew, um, you knew that God was real and you knew to answer the call. And what's amazing to hear about your story um, with, with ALS and that, 
depression that you described as, as a covering over you, um, which then you alluded to that being uh, very much a, a sp really spiritual warfare that, that was happening right there. And the word says that, that his word is our uh, offensive weapon. And that just blows my mind for, for most people in that position. And they want to say, okay, well, 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 what can I do? And they're going to run to every, every little thing they can to try to fix this, this problem. But you, you know, it's amazing when you said that God spoke to you and, and you literally got up and you made a plan, you know, in my mind, immediately plan goes, okay, well, who can I talk to? What can I do? Um, but you didn't do that. You said the first thing you do is you grabbed your Bible and you just, that was your plan was, was, was the scripture, right? You said, there's no medicine. There's no way to heal this, but you knew that that was your medicine. Yes. That, <laughs> that, that, that was it. That there was, there was nothing that you could do. That's right. You, you were fully relying on God and you um, you knew that that uh, you had to to get into his word and, and get that deep into you. I, I, I love that it. it wasn't just, um, you know, one, one prayer, one scripture reading. It was it, this was something that you had to say out loud and then repeat that over and over and over. You were meditating on his word um, and that uh, that is essentially what healed you, which is just incredible to me when did you know um like was there a moment where you understood or realized that you were actually physically healed that you no longer had als i am so glad you asked that question because it was an awesome day and i had been i had been um this is about a year after uh, the first visit to mayo yeah and i had uh, been teaching a class and um, I was coming home from that class and I drove, I, I had gone before, but let, let me back up. Part of my plan, part of my plan was to go to a church, a pastor that I knew who uh, walks in faith and believes in healing. Yeah. And a, a dear friend, and I went to visit him that one day before I went to Mayo. And I think this is really critical because I told my husband, I said, I can't go to Mayo until I go to the pastor. Yeah. And have the church pray over me. Wow. So I had gone to this dear friend, pastor, had him pray and his, his whole staff prayed over me. And so then I went to Mayo. That was part of my plan. Yeah. And so when I, after the second time, that was the second time to Mayo. But anyway, so I had the pastor pray over me. I'm coming, I'm driving home. This is a year later. This is an I'm, appointment that they, that they had set up the year prior or no, this, this appointment. This, this was a year later, the second appointment to Mayo. This was yeah. my second appointment. Was this, was this planned in advance that you were going to come back a year afterwards? Yes. Okay. Yes. Yes. So I had gone back to Mayo and they, um, well, before I went back to Mayo though, I was driving home from this class. I, as I drove by, um, I had a contact lens had torn in my eye. And I don't know if you know what that feels like, but it feels like glass in your eyes. Oh, wow. Very uncomfortable. Yeah. And so I was driving with one eye could see and the other eye was just almost swollen and red and it yeah. still had the contact in it. And I heard in my heart, go in, go turn around and thank the pastor that prayed for me. Yeah. And so in my mind, I'm driving and I'm going, uh, I think I'm going to go home and get my lens out, not go back later because <laughs> I can't see to drive and my eyes all swollen and, you know, bloodshot and all that. And but as I drove by that turn, I'm telling you again, it was like miraculous. I find myself turning in. My head is thinking I'm going home. My heart is following what my spirit said. Yeah. If, I don't know if you've ever been in that situation before, but that's what happened. Yeah. And yeah. so I turned in and I went in and I 
I told the pastor, I said, I, you know, you prayed for me a year ago. And I reminded him of that prayer. And in that morning, that very morning that I turned in, he had had someone who a year before, the same week I went in for prayer, for ALS, he had a congregational member who had died from ALS. Mm. And so that morning he had received a letter from her husband telling him, telling him of all the beautiful things that had happened that God had taught the husband of the dying woman oh what God. had happened to him through that whole process. So when I walked in that morning and I said, I just want to thank you for praying for me. And he was like teary eyed. He's like, I can't believe, you know, that I walked in for, first of all, you know, that I could walk because yeah. I hadn't seen him. And so he was, he was so thankful that I was okay at that point. And so I'm driving away. He hugs me and he says, you're going to be my Sunday morning service this Sunday morning. And I'm so excited. And, you know, he was so thankful and he prayed for me again. And as I was pulling out of the church parking lot, the scripture came to mind. And this just hit me. Ten were healed, but only one turned back. Mm, yeah. No, no, no. <sighs> And I was like, God, you set this up for me. <laughs> and it just, the overwhelming understanding came, I'm now healed. Yeah. I'm, I'm now healed. Yeah. And what was really weird, there was a, a builder, this is so crazy, Samuel, in my neighborhood that I had to drive by every single day for that year that their initials for the building was ALS. Every day I drove by it. Oh, yeah. Do you know that very week that sun came down? Wow. And when I drove in, wow. I drove in my neighborhood and I'm going, I am healed. I am healed. <laughs> I'm healed. Thank you, Jesus. So then I go back to Mayo yeah. and I could see the look on the neurologist's face when I, you know, when I came in. And he had a look of terror. I'm telling you the truth. Yeah. He had a look of terror. Just from you walking in. When I, just from me walking in. My husband noticed it too. So oh, I sat down and he, he, you know, he rolls his stool up to, to look at me. And he starts the examination. And after the examination, he sits down on the stool and he looks in my eyes and he pushes back and he said, I don't understand this. He said, you've had no other. There's been no change at all. And I said, I understand it. <laughs> yeah. He said, Robin, I can't explain this to you. I cannot explain this to you. I said, you don't have to. I said, prayer. I understand. <laughs> I said, it was prayer. It was God. And he, he kind of nodded. He didn't, you know, he didn't wholeheartedly agree. He kind of nodded at me. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> but I walked out that day and he said, this was his words to me, Robin, if you ever need me, and I certainly hope you don't, you can come back and see me, but there's no need for you to come back. Wow. <laughs> and, you know, Samuel, when you come that close to such a devastating, and I'm talking about devastation, and it, it, was, it was so scary and so real. And I knew that day when I pulled, it, it was the instant I pulled out of the parking lot and that thought, that parable, that story came to mind in scripture where Jesus had healed the 10 lepers, but only one turned back. And he asked that man, but where are the other nine? And you know, sometimes, sometimes I think God just wants to really speak to the one that's willing to turn back. And I was this close to just driving on that day. <laughs> and I really think that my spirit, the Holy Spirit in me said, no, mm -mm. you got to listen. You got, you've got to, this is life or death, Robin. Turning in this place this day is life or death. And I think, you know, how important is it that we are 
intimate with God, it's life or death. How important is it to hear his voice? For me, Samuel, it's been life or death. Let me give you another for instance. We had moved to Texas, Austin, uh, because my son took my grandchildren there. <laughs> and so we had um, moved to Austin. We kept our home in South Carolina. This was this was a little bit over a year ago. And um, we had been in San Antonio because I wanted to buy a cow's, uh, cowhide rug for my floor. Of course, if you're in Texas, you have to have a cowhide rug. <laughs> <laughs> so, so we drove to San Antonio because we knew there were businesses there that had good quality rugs. So uh, on the way home, on the way home, I had, it was about an hour and a half from my home in Texas. And so I had, I had been really tired from the day before we had done, we were really busy. So I laid my, reclined my chair in the car all the way back and I fell asleep and I was asleep for a while and out of a dead and I mean dead sleep I'm a heavy sleeper when I once I get to sleep I'm a heavy sleeper it can't hardly wake me up yeah. but immediately I sat up straight in my chair and I buckled in and my husband looked over at me because that's unusual for me you know to like from dead sleep to wide awake yeah and he said what is going on and he and I said to him I said I feel like the Holy Spirit's telling me to buckle in because I didn't have my buckle on. I was just reclined back, which I know that you're not supposed to do that, but that's what I did that day. Yeah. I set up and I put my seat on, my buckle on. I said, I felt like the Lord is telling me, buckle in right now. And he's, you know, he just went on about driving and, you know, we started just talking and we got on the highway 20 minutes, and I mean 20 minutes from that time I sat straight up. We were in an accident on the highway going 75 miles an hour. We totaled our enclave, mm -hmm. and I mean totaled it. The entire front was smashed in. Samuel, had I not heard, had I not had intimacy, yeah. I would have been dead that day. The policeman said, this wreck, he said, it's so bad. He said, he said, Robin, had it been a few years back, we would have been cutting you out of this vehicle. Every airbag in the entire enclave was down. The entire front was smashed in. My head hit, even with the seat belt, hit the glass and put a crack in the front glass. Wow. It, so the front glass had my head imprint, but the, the, um, airbag protected me, but I guess my head hit first and then the, you know, then the airbag. Had I not heard the voice of God, I would have been dead that day. Yeah. And so when I say intimacy with the Lord is life or death, I've lived <laughs> too, too many times. Yeah. And so, you know, and part of that people, you know, part of it starts with believing Samuel that God will speak. You know, I love your name, <laughs> Samuel, <laughs> because God does speak to his people. But, you know, people will say, well, why don't I hear God? You know, why don't I hear him speak to my heart? I don't hear. I never hear him. Yeah. It all starts with expectation. You know, if you don't expect him to speak, guess what? You'll never hear him speak. Yeah. You have to be willing to say, okay, God, I want to hear your voice. And I remember 30 years ago, I had a diary, that a journal I started writing, and it, it was called, When My God Speaks to Me. And so, you know, there's an expectation. And if you have that expectation, it, it's like, you know, it's like the Lord opens up your hearing, for you so that you can hear his words. I remember one time I was in prayer and I said, Lord, why don't you speak to me more often? He said, Robin, I speak all the time. I said, why don't I hear you speak all the time then? And he said, because your head is full of useless things. 
<laughs> I thought that is so true. My head is full of useless things. How many times in a day do we get on Facebook and waste hours upon hours and we could spend that time in the Word of God reading it or watching a useless television program or whatever? Yeah. So, you, you know, God, is, God wants us to know that he, he hears our prayers. The word is very clear. And he wants us to know that we can hear his voice. My sheep hear my voice. That's what the word says, and that is his truth. And when you say, God, I want to hear it more clearly, usually what happens is there's some idols that come down first. <laughs> And then he opens up your hearing. So, you know, when you pray that prayer, beware that God will bring some, uh, some of your idols in front of your face that you have to let go of. And for me, mine was a business card. You know, that was one of my mm -hmm. idols. But when you, when you decide to let him do the talking, he will let you do the hearing if you're sincere and you will listen. Yeah. Wow. That is so incredible. Um, that really speaks to the book. Oh, I, I want to get into the book. Um, this is, this, this, this is so good. Um, this is really what the book is like. It's, it's encouraging and, and, and it's challenging. Um, but I want to comment on, on that intimacy because it's, uh, you know, from reading the book, you know, it's, it's very, very clear, um, that, that you have that. And I just want to comment on, on what you said about, when God spoke to you about, are you going to listen to what you've been teaching for the past 30 years? That was um, so impactful because I think it goes to what you spoke to earlier about so many Christians that go to church, they believe. Um, yet um, what God was wanting for you to do was to take that belief and, and, and put it into action, right? Because if, if you truly believed what, what you had been teaching, you would not have been lying in bed. Right. And um, and I think that's where, where, where so many so many of us uh, get stuck. We believe here, um, but, but we're not we're not walking it out. We have to answer that call. Um, and, 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 you, and you did that once again. God, God shows up. Uh, so that's just so incredible to me. But I, I kind of had some questions, as I imagine a lot of listeners do as well. And you've already touched on this as far as uh, healing goes and, and why God chooses to heal some and others. You know, you mentioned with the, the pastor that, um, which, which is an incredible story that he, he had the same disease, two, two women, one, one was healed, one was not like, since you've already, um, just by telling your story have somewhat answered this question. Um, and God, God will, will, uh, what he wills, um, you know, choose to heal, um, who, who he, who he heals and uh, but but in either case um we see that the surviving husband um was, was thankful to that pastor just as you were thankful for your healing um so uh this is pretty incredible but i want to kind of get into some of the, the nuances of is believing and, and you 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 already mentioned it that there's there's an expectation uh on our part and scripture does seem to to lend itself to that but i think where a lot of people land on healing um, the, the, there's kind of the jump to one extreme or the other. So some will, will just come out and say, well, God doesn't do that anymore. He just, uh, he, you know, that was something he did. Um, you know, we can read about it. That was special, you know, that, uh, Jesus ministry and his apostles, but, uh, you know, today he doesn't really, he doesn't you know, really do that. The healing that at that time was just for a certain purpose. And, and, and that's, um, you know, we, we, we can read about it, but, but he doesn't heal. Um, and on the other extreme, um, you know, you have this, which I think is also a, a dangerous teaching that, um, that he will always heal right. and, uh, you just have to have enough faith. Therefore, if you aren't being healed, you do not have enough faith. Um, and that's, uh, you know, that, that's, that's really like a, a belief in, in your, in your own faith, um, but uh, as you mentioned, you know, you did mention an expectation and that expectation is for, for God to, to do his will. So I guess I have a few questions and I, I guess I'll let you answer them. But um, sure. um, so is healing always God's will? Um, if not, how can we pray with an expectation for him to do so? Um, 
And then if you, if you had not, um, and you sort of lended this earlier, but um, if you had set the death, would that have been detrimental to your healing? As you mentioned earlier, you had, you had visions that uh, you believe were demonic in nature of your um, paralysis. And, and so I think you already answered that, but go ahead um, and, and, and speak to this um, dichotomy of uh, God's will and healing. Well, I think it's really critical, absolutely critical that we know that God is sovereign. He doesn't always choose to heal, to answer our prayers in the way we expect him to. You know, uh, 20 some years ago, I prayed for a little boy who had cancer. And I'm telling you, we had a whole community that stood in faith, believing that that child was going to be healed even to the point of on his deathbed, myself and my prayer ministers were with the family and we were praying for that child, even at the last breath that he took, that he was gonna be healed. And God doesn't always choose to answer our prayers because he knows better than we know what needs to happen. So we have to start with the premise that God knows best regardless. I had a friend that I I used to pray for before he passed away, that was his prayer minister. He said, if I'm healed here, I'm healed. If I'm healed there, I'm healed. Either way, I'm healed. Yeah. Yeah. And I thought, what a powerful, powerful message. Because what that says up front is God, you're sovereign. I'll accept your will either way. Yeah. But here's what, here's what I have chosen to do over my years of ministry. I always ask someone that I'm praying for healing, what do you want me to pray? If you want me to pray for healing, I'm going to keep asking God until you take your last breath. Yeah. And, and so what we, what we have to realize from the very beginning is we don't know God's will Only God knows. But if there's someone here who wants to be healed, then I'm going to pray for healing until they do take their last breath. And, you know, because God could could heal in that last second of life if he chooses. And we know that. We know he could. So you have to start with that premise that it is totally totally God's will. He's sovereign. But here's the bottom line. He, he's called Jehovah Rapha for a reason. Yeah. I am the God who heals. Yeah. He said, I will bless your bread. I will bless your water and I will take disease from among you. There's plenty of scripture that will, that will lock into the fact that it is God's intention to heal, but it doesn't mean that he heals every time, every way. Death itself is a kind of healing because we leave this world and we go to the next to be with Jesus. And that is the ultimate healing. We leave uh, all the sickness and disease behind and we meet him face to face. So that is the ultimate healing. And I remember when I was praying for that young child many years ago, and I was offended when I heard that because I was young and I was in faith and I believed. And one of the other darkest days that I've ever had in my life is the day that little boy died because he would call me up in the middle of the night, two o'clock in the morning, and he would say, Miss Robin, will you come pray for me? And I would get up out of my bed and I would drive the two minutes down the block, around the block, and I would go lay at the foot of his bed with my hand on his feet and pray for him through through the night. Hmm. And I really believed that God was going to heal him. And, you know, that little boy, what he would say, his mom would say, What's what what do you want? What's what do you want most? I won't use his name, but precious little child, his mom would ask him that question and he would say, I just want my coach to be saved. I just want coach to be saved. He wouldn't say, I want to be healed. He'd say, I want coach to be saved. Do you know at that child's funeral, 
coach gave his life to the Lord. Wow. And then two years later, that coach went to be with the Lord. Wow. So you talk about God lining things up. You know, you can't help but wonder. You know, God heard that when Tucker, when he said that, all I want is coach to be healed. God heard that. He did. God knew what it was going to take for coach to be healed. And at that child's funeral, that man gave his life to the Lord that day. Wow. And so, you know, we think, we think, oh, we it's got to be our way. You know, it's got to be our way. But a mature faith in, in God says, no, it's got to be your way, God. And, uh, you know, I had a pastor ask me one time, he said, how in the world can you pray for someone when you know, absolutely know, that their illness uh, leads to death? I said, how can I not pray? Yeah. How can I not pray? Because, yeah. you know, if, 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 if they want healing, then we stand in faith believing God can at any moment do it. We know it's his will to heal. Past that, we don't know anything else. We don't know the big picture, and we've got to be okay with not knowing the big picture. Yeah, that's very well said. Um, just a couple other things I, I, for, I forgot to comment on. Um, also taking them back um, about what you were saying. But, uh, you know, your story is unique in, in, in that you, you kind of came into uh, an understanding that you were healed, um, and, but that wasn't like some of the healings we, we see in the scripture, um, you know, where Jesus says, you know, pick up your mat and walk. It, it, it wasn't necessarily something um, nonetheless miraculous, but wasn't instantaneous in, in, in a sense that uh, it was alleviated all at once in that very moment. Um, so I, I really love, I love that uh, about your healing specifically is that um, God was teaching you something as, as you're doing this healing. And this is um, after years and years of, of, of ministry and he's still, still, still teaching you um, what you've been <laughs> teaching. Uh, and, and you had to really walk through that, uh, which is incredible. And you, you have a quote that you said in your book that you really uh, illustrated so well in your story. Uh, and I think for, for so many people, when they're in this situation, as I mentioned earlier, they want to grab the bull by the horns and try everything they can to do to receive this healing. And then when they're kind of at their, when they're at their end of the rope and they've got nothing else to do, that's when they want to hit their knees in, in prayer. But you, you flip that on its head um, and, and you say this in your book looking for, for the quote, but it's, uh, you know, prayer should not be your, your last resort. I'm yes. Kind of yes. Um, but it's uh, your first defense, it's your first defense. <laughs> yeah. Um, uh, so, so, so talk a little bit about that. And then I, I want to kind of get into um, some of the stories that you had in your books. That's one thing I really loved about your, about your book is that it's, it's filled with just all these personal stories. Um, so I just want to get into a couple of those. Um, but, but talk about how, how prayer is your, not your last resort, but your first defense. Well, you know, um, uh, the Psalm 30 verse two, just, Oh Lord, my God, I cried out to you and you healed me. And this is, this is, you know, this was David. This was the heart of God, because when I first started uh, in ministry, before I even started in, in ministry, prayer was so vital in my life. Uh, as a young woman, my son had an issue, um, uh, was, was legs perthes. He had been on prednisone for breathing because he was allergic to everything. And um, he had a, an issue with his trach, trachea, uh, his trach would collapse inward. So he, he could get air in, but he couldn't get it out. Mm -hmm. And so he had to be on prednisone quite a bit. And, and one day I got a call from my mother and she was watching my son. And she said, he was like maybe three and a half years old. And 
she said, he can't walk today. And I said, what? And she said, well, your Logan is saying he, he can't walk. And I thought that I was at work. And so I kind of panicked and I said, well, I don't know what in the world that even means, but I'm going to come home early. And so I came home that day from work and he just wouldn't walk and he was so young. And I thought that doesn't make sense for a little three-year-old child is usually a point running all over, the, jumping and, you know, on everything. And so I made an appointment with our pediatrician and I took him in and, and, um, he, he said, Robin, I'm really concerned about this. And he, he said, I, it's, there's, there's an issue there. I'm not sure what it is, but we need to get him to UVA. We were living in Virginia at the time. And so um, uh, cystic fibrosis was an issue also with lungs. And so he, he called me at work that following day and he said, I'm gonna set it up. He said, but I think we need to check him for cystic fibrosis. And of course, that's where children die at age 11. You know, that that's typical. And so I, I really, I was like, wait, wait. I mean, my son is, and my son is fine. And he said, no, there's more to this story. And we, we really need to get to the bottom of what's going on here. And so for that one week that we had to wait to get into Maya, I mean, to get into UVA, oh my goodness, you talk about prayer. I spent every split second for a week. I could not sleep. I could not eat. I could not think. And I just went into this full prayer mode, just crying out to God, crying, crying, crying. I mean, you know, the Lord has put me through some real tests with prayer. And yeah. this was early on, you know, he, he's, he was just a small child. And so I prayed that entire week and I cried and begged and pleaded and, so anyway, finally we made it to we made it to UVA and the doctors ran the test and they found out that it was legs perthes and that's where the hip actually collapsed from corrosion where the blood circulation is cut off from the hip and it dissolves. It basically dissolves the joint. And at that time I remember that they said, well, he's either going to be in a body cast for life or he's going to um, be in a wheelchair. I mean, the diagnosis was pretty you know, profound and scary for a young mother with a young little child. Yeah. And I just remember saying in my heart, no, he's not. Yeah. No, he is not. And I remember when we got back home, my little child, my son came up to me and he, he, I was crying. I was in the living room and he came into the living room and he patted me on my face and he said, mommy, it's okay. It's okay if I have to be in a wheelchair. It'll be okay. Don't don't cry, mommy. <laughs> and I remember looking at him, son. You will not be. You will not be. And I just knew in my heart, through all the sadness and all the tears, that God was doing something. You yeah. know, even then. And so finally, um, the doctor at UVA told us to we're we're going to try something experimental. We've never tried this before. We're going to give you a list of exercises to try. We're not putting him in a body cast. We're not putting him in a, in a brace. We're not putting him in a wheelchair. We're going to try something experimental. We want you to do these exercises every day for six months and come back in six months. And so we did what he said to do. In six months, we took our son back. He got the x-ray and the doctor at UVA said, unless you would take an x-ray, you would never, ever know this child ever had legs perthes. And so, you know, even through that, even through that experience, it was God building in me faith for healing. Yeah. yeah. It was, it was him teaching me and building in me. And, you know, at that time I had, I didn't rely on the scriptures as much as I did just crying out, you know, unbelievably yeah. in, in prayer. And so that really started to build a prayer life in me and prayer became important in a whole new level. It was a whole new, you know, I wasn't just saying prayer till the go and at night in the morning when you get up and it, when you bless your food, yeah. It was a prayer life that started 
And I would turn on my praise music. I remember I would be in my suburban. We would pull, I would pull, I would take the kids to school. This was a little bit later, but this was a habit of mine. I would turn on my praise music. I would take the kids to school and on the way back I would pull into my dry into my garage and I remember I would sit in that suburban sometimes until lunchtime when my husband got home from lunch. I would still be <laughs> from eight in the morning till twelve and I was still sitting in that car praying because the presence of the Lord was so strong I didn't want to get out. Yeah. And so so the Lord really uh, taught me through a series of very serious issues in my life how to rely on him in prayer. So I think intimacy really started out of crisis for me. Yeah, Intimacy with the Lord started out of crisis. And I think that it does with most of us because we know when we're in need, we know who to turn to. But what I did afterwards is when the crisis had subsided, I was still in a posture of prayer. Yeah. And so yeah. I, I really started to delve into prayer. And that's when I learned to stop in the midst of prayer and listen. And I learned that listening was just as important or more important, I should say, than the prayer itself. Wow. Yeah. So, so prayer became a, a major part of my life very early on. Yeah, yeah. We, we, you kind of see uh, just how God has used um, all these different events and even trials uh, in, in your life to, to bring about his goodwill. It, it reminds me of, uh, of Joseph uh, and, and, and his, his walk and the tragedies and, um, you know, for, for so many people, it's, it's easy to, to give up or, or give in. But I think what you, what you've illustrated is it's, it's really truly about trusting in God, um, and his will over, over your life and yes. you can use all those things, uh, for, for good. Um, and I'm in the book at the end of each chapter, I've got what's called as intentional living. And these are just little tips that will get you through the day. And for this, I, this was on prayer. I was pray expecting answers. Pray no, knowing God has shown light as seed on your path. In other words, he's already, he's, he's going to show you what's coming. Pray with unwavering faith that God can do anything. You, you, if, you, if you pray knowing God can do anything, then you're more apt to expect God to do something. And then I said, persist in prayer, expecting him to answer in line with his name, his character, and his word. Because like I mentioned, Jehovah Rapha is his name. Mm -hmm. So his name is his character. It's his character to heal. He makes that promise. And his word is his promise to heal. So it, when you put all that together in prayer, then you're not just out, you know, it's just not some random thing. Yeah. You have you have something to hold on to. Pray with purpose from a position of victory, which is critical when you're praying. In other words, if you pray in a prayer, and I hear this all the time, I, I, I was asked to train a group of prayer ministers in Florida for an international ministry, Christian healing ministries. And I remember, you know, as, as I would work with prayer ministers, uh, sometimes people will not pray from a stance of victory. They pray from a stance of defeat. And that's where I really learned to thank God in advance for the healing that was coming. Thank him for the, for the healing. Thank him in advance. Pray from a position of victory. And then pray with passion, knowing that God stores up every tear you shed. So when we're in prayer, you know, you, you, it's a place that you get truly uh, transparent before, before the Lord. You get very transparent. And when you pray with those things in mind that God is, is hearing your prayers and he's collecting your tears, if you really believe that, 
then you have to believe that he really cares about every thought, every problem, every issue you have, and that's major. Uh, when, you, when you start to do that, then you pray from a whole different vantage point. Yeah, wow. Yeah, that's, that's incredible. And it, it starts with, uh, you know, that, like you said, the knowledge of God and, and who he is and his character. Um, uh, that's, that, that's, that's incredible. Um, I love that. Okay, so let me, let me get into some of the other stories that you, you had uh, in your book that <laughs> stood out to me. Um, I thought you, I have three in particular that I just wanted you to kind of touch on. Um, and people can pick up the book to hear, you know, the whole story. But um, you, you told a story about a, a young man named Ian um, that you were uh, praying about in, in your prayer group with, uh, or praying, you were praying with him. Um, can you tell a little bit of that story? Okay, can you remind me a little bit more because I changed the names uh, oh, okay. to protect okay. me. <laughs> I got you. Um, so you were in a prayer group with this young man and uh, God spoke to you um, to, to pray with him uh, about something in, in particular. Um, he, he was struggling with, with suicide. Okay, yes, yes. Um, can, what page is that on? Do you have it? Do you see it in the book or do you just take the notes? Yeah, I, I don't, I don't remember what, what page it was on particular, but I remember, um, well, I'm sorry, I'm trying, there's okay. been so many different people and I'm, it's been a while since I wrote the book, so I was it's trying okay. to figure out. Well, let's move, let's, it, it, um, it might come to you or I might be able to find the page, but let's, let's uh, move on to a different story then. Okay. Um, we, can, we can always circle back around to that one. Um, but there was a, this, I got the name written down, but it may not be so helpful because it's not a real it's name. It's not. Um, but, um, her name was, uh, um, jewel in, in the book and it was a story about about her about her house oh yes that's a good story I'll tell I'll be happy to tell that one and sometimes I mean that that's that's the hard thing about the book I mean I had to I changed all the names to protect yeah the privacy of yeah. the people that I dealt with but um, jewel we had uh, she specifically I, I ministered with her for several months and she had a really bad situation that had happened. Her husband had become sick with cancer and he had lost his job because he had so, he had missed so many days because going to the hospital and back and forth mm -hmm. and all that sort of thing. Wow. And through losing that job, they lost their health insurance and they were now financially in a bind. They were losing their home. Um, she worked, but she didn't make enough money to pay for the insurance and she didn't make enough money to pay for the house payments. And so she was in a situation where it was God or nothing, down to nothing. She was just months away from losing her home. It was, uh, gonna, she was going to have to go through bankruptcy. And so we entered into prayer and that was one of the things that was a regular prayer for her. And we prayed about three months specifically for God to intervene because she didn't want to lose her home. Yeah. And one Monday morning, I heard this, the telephone rang. I went to answer the telephone and I heard someone on the other end crying profusely, just screaming. <laughs> And I said, calm down. I can't understand. I can't understand. And she had gone into work that Friday. And a, one of her clients asked her what, she, you know, what she was doing about her home situation. And she said, well, I, on Monday, I have to go into bankruptcy. And the woman that was her client said, will you meet me here Monday morning? And she said, well, yeah, is it important? She said, it's, it's very important. So she went in that morning and met with the woman, and the woman put a check in her hand for $187,000. What? Paid her home off completely. The woman, <laughs> Jewel is on the phone screaming and crying, Robin, God heard our prayers. God heard our prayers. 
And he really did. She paid her home off completely. That's true. Jewel took the check, went to the bank, paid off her home, owned the home free and clear. Now, you know, that's the kind of miracles I'm telling you, Samuel, that I have witnessed. And it's only because God's goodness and because I have believed with everything in me that God does the impossible. Yeah. He does the impossible. <laughs> that's an incredible story. Um, <laughs> I I remember this next one. This was a, uh, in the, in the book, her name was Susan, but uh, you were you're washing um, her feet. Oh, my goodness. Yes. Oh, that was so beautiful. Um, you know, I think that one of the things that you and I can do that best reflect God is simply to show love. And if we, if we want to reflect God, God is love. And I remember this day, I, I had a, at the time I was, uh, I had a prayer ministry in my church and I had a, a prayer, I don't know, I can't remember how many prayer ministers, but we covered Monday through Friday and Monday night and Tuesday night uh, for, for prayer for the community. And one of the local churches had um, a destitute woman come, and she lived in a van with her with her boyfriend, and um, she, they had nothing. They had absolutely nothing. And but so he recommended he was taking care of their physical needs, giving them food, shelter, and clothing at this this local church. But he sent her to our prayer ministry for prayer yeah. and uh, to, for inner healing and, and things like that. So deliverance and ministry. And so when she walked in that day, she was, her hair was disheveled and she was still dirty. She, you could tell she hadn't had a bath. She, she, her clothes were torn and tattered and, she sat down and we, my prayer partner and I sat down in front of her and just almost as I was sitting in the chair, I just heard the soft whisper of the Lord in my heart, wash her feet. And so, you know, I kind of leaned over to my prayer partner and quietly said that this is what I feel like the Lord is saying for us to do, you know. And so we, we told her, us just sit right here and we have a few things to take care of before we start in prayer. And so my prayer partner goes and she prepares the, the foot washing bath for her. And she brings it in and we ask, we said, would you mind terribly if we start out prayer by washing your feet? And we explain that, that in scripture, that's what Jesus did with his disciples as he was teaching them about servanthood. And so she said, no, I don't mind at all, you know. And so she lifted her feet up and Samuel, as her feet went into the water, she began to cry. Mm -hmm. And she, her head was hung down and she lifted up her head and she said, why would you do this for me? And I remember looking at her and I said, because God loves you and we love you. And at that very moment, Samuel, she gave her, she gave her life to Jesus. Wow. We didn't even have to pray. We didn't have to do anything. She just gave her life right there and then. And it was like you, you know, she just could feel the love of Christ. And I'll never forget how the light and the love of Christ just filled her. It was like, it was like the first time she had ever felt love in her whole life. Wow. And so my lesson there was, you know, God, when he speaks, there's a reason. And he knows so, we can't even fathom in our own minds what is going to touch another heart. We can't, we can, you know, we go through our routines. Oh, we think we know, you know, we think, oh, Christian and been minister forever. No, when God does it, he does it in such a profound way. 
you know, he just kind of moved us out of the way. <laughs> he just kind of moved us out of the way. And it was an intimate moment between that woman and God where he reached down and touched the deepest part of her soul and he healed her in an instant. And this drug addicted, you know, living with her boyfriend, using foul language in an instant. she would, And do you know that woman is a prayer minister today? Wow. <laughs> Isn't that beautiful? It's unbelievable. Wow. It's incredible. Yeah. You're, you, you know, for the listener, the, the book is filled with just story after story after story like this. So I, you know, and really it, it the book was was not uh, what what I, what I thought it was going to be, and your, your your personal story is is woven throughout. Um, but it is it's really so much more than that, and and it's 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 funny hearing you talk now, and you know talking about your, your life of ministry because it, it's it's all there in the book you know it, it's 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 not just storytelling you you really truly are teaching and ministering all, all throughout um as you kind of pointed out but one of the chapters that um impacted me the most was uh on the one on on love and it was actually in the middle of the book i knew there was a love challenge i was expecting that to come like at the end of the book uh you dropped it right there in the middle of the book um i'd like to just read um First uh, Corinthians 13, four through seven, speaking about those attributes and then just have you touch on uh, a couple of those. Sure. Um, and then we'll move on to uh, some more personal questions and, and close out. Um, so this is once again, First uh, Corinthians 13, four through seven. Love is, um, of course, this is, I know you, you mentioned this is kind of what we hear at weddings all the time and you sort of elaborate that and, and, and build on um, just the power of this verse. Um, love is patient and kind. Love is not jealous or boastful or proud or rude. It does not demand its own way. It is not uh, irritable, and it keeps no record of being wronged. It does not rejoice about injustice, but rejoices whenever the truth wins out. Love never gives up, never loses faith, is always hopeful, and endures through every circumstance. Um, so there's so much there. Um, and uh, you kind of go through those attributes, you know, one by one in the book. But I just want to touch on on, on a, a couple of them. Um, so talk about if you talk can about, talk about quickly about, about uh, envy. Absolutely. Well, what I what I found so astonishing when this really, you know, because it is always almost always heard at a wedding. Yeah. And when I, you know, I've been reading through the Bible for many years, every year trying to read through several times a year. But what, what hit me about this is Apostle Paul, you know, in Corinthians, he's on, on chapter 12 and chapter 14, he's teaching the church about walking in power. Now, so on bookends, it's like bookends on, uh, on 12 and 14 in the chapters, he's talking about how to be powerful. And right in the midst of it, he stops and he tells you mm. about, he explains what biblical love looks like. And so we, we think of that pa passage as about marital love, but it's not. What this is, this whole passage is teaching us Without love, you're a, a a noisy gong. Yeah. No matter what you're doing, you're you're noise in the ears of God. You, you're you're just noisy. Um, without love, you're nothing at all. So basically, Paul is teaching the Corinthian church: if you want to be like God, if you want to walk like you're supposed to walk as believers. As believers, as Christians, believers in Jesus, you start with this love. How powerful is it? Because the word of God says love. Well, this is what I, my quote. Love is the deepest expression of God in us because God is love. It's the deepest expression of God in us because God is love. So when you start to understand, if you took this scripture alone and you say, I want to reflect God, if you just follow these few steps right here, you're going to look a whole lot more like God than most people. <laughs> and so when I, I start breaking this down, I remember patience, you know, being patient. Uh, I'll tell a real quick 
um, story there, I used to have road rage. Mm. And, you know, I would be the first to be speeding, which is breaking the law, <laughs> which is ungodly. <laughs> Because I didn't have patience. I was a patient person. And I remember God really trying to work with me and teach me patience. Just, uh, just pick up where you left off um, about how God was teaching you patience. Okay. Okay. As I said, uh, Samuel, the lesson for road rage was not a pleasant one, needless to say. <laughs> I had been doing the television interview. I was on my way home. It was very late at night um, because the show was late. And so I think it was about one o'clock in the morning, I got stopped for speeding. I was on the interstate. I was by myself. It was out in the country. <laughs> And the policeman was not very nice. He gave me the ticket. <laughs> so, so anyway, that was not enough to teach Robin not to have road rage. I continued on as I was pulling into my hometown where I lived at the time, two o'clock in the morning, flying through an empty road, <laughs> pulling into town, I got another ticket. I just put my hands up in the air. Okay, God, I've got it. <laughs> From that point on, I learned that God was, he meant business. Yeah. You know, sometimes we, sometimes we're so foolish to think that the small things do not matter to God. Mm. But Samuel, God was speaking very clear, clearly to me that night through that series of events that he wanted me to learn that patience was a virtue that I needed to honor him and his word through my life. Yeah. So, you know, it wasn't, it wasn't just about speeding, although it breaking the law, you know, God takes that seriously. And so from that point on, I learned patience. Wow. I did not get in such a hurry anymore. And, you know, when God taught me some of the things about as I, as, as I was doing my own love test, and that's really what it was, I was putting myself to this test. And one of the tests that I had, you know, through this is learning to love other people when they're not necessarily loving me. And I had a situation that came up while I was writing the book. And um, someone had, had called me, they needed me to take care of something for them, which, uh, which I had given up about three days of my own personal work time. And then, and then it turned out that they didn't need what I, what I had done. Mm. And I did not get a thank you. I did not get a payment, but I just lost three days of work. Yeah. So I am getting ready for work one day and I was in the shower and I, as I was just, you know, sometimes you, you're just thinking, I was thinking, uh, the more I thought about it, the matter I got. And I was so aggravated by the time I was, I was getting dressed for work and I, it was just, by the time I was getting, I was furious and it was, God stopped me right in my track, Samuel. And he said, what are you writing about? And it hit me. And I said, Lord, oh my goodness, I'm so mad at that person. So I went straight to the phone and I picked up the phone and I said, I called the person and I said, you know, I was very upset with what went down. And I said, and I've been angry at you. And I said, I want to ask you to forgive me. And they, you know, callously said, oh, sure, no worries, no problem. <laughs> they didn't say, well, would you for two? Right. And I kind of laughed and I said, they said, well, yeah, you know, callously. Yeah, well, I'll forgive you. And I, I, so after a few minutes, I got off the phone and I said, thank you, Lord, for such a wonderful lesson. The lesson for me was I have to walk like Jesus. 
and not expect other people to walk like Jesus. And that's the true test of love. <laughs> so, wow, that's a... <laughs> so even after, you know, I mean, it's like a lesson, you know, when the word of God says the Holy Spirit will be your teacher, he really will be your teacher. <laughs> That's the truth. Wow. Yeah. Cause you could have stopped right then and there and just in, in, in your heart of, you know, let it go and not, not pick up the phone, but yeah. there was more to learn. God was showing yes. And <laughs> you're, you're still not going to get, you know, uh, <laughs> you know, what, you know <laughs> what feels like, like justice. And, um, <laughs> and that is so true about God's love for us because um, uh, that's, we don't how- deserve it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That that's that's the truth. Um, yeah, that was, that was one of my questions about about that love challenge because um, I'm I'm committing to do it. And uh, you know, for those listening, it's 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 just those love attributes, and it's for 30 days, basically just assessing yourself um, on on each of those. And um, I know I've got a lot of room, uh, a lot of room uh, for for improvement. Uh, you know, so. Um, so I'm reluctantly, uh, you know, I'm not, I'm feeling challenged, but uh, I'm, I'm, I'm going to do that. Um, but, you know, I, I think that's, it's, it's great how, how you put it there. And it really, ultimately, God is, is teaching us through, through his love and his grace, um, how, how to be more like him. Um, and so it's really, it, it goes back to just being, being intimate with God and, 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 in being vested in his word and in, in prayer and, and he's faithful to to sanctify us and change us and make us more like him so that's uh and that's all through his spirit he he, he you know as your story said he he called you to to you know he basically pointed out um uh your your need uh to to, to be loving um d- yeah. despite despite what we get in return um and that's uh that's a, a hard hard call to answer but that's what he's called us to do um so that's that, that's beautiful um ah okay great so i want to move into uh our last segment this is going to be like i said personal questions um uh, so let's start out with uh, your favorite book of the bible favorite character of the bible and verse of the bible okay um the favorite book oh that's a tough one i think first john because i mean it's such a short 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 little book but um, and and it, it really challenges us to look at God and his love. And I love that. You know, the word of God says, if you have hatred in your heart for another, it's the same as murder. And so as we're talking about love and we're challenging ourselves, there are regrets that or situations that we hold in our heart that we have anger or bitterness or unforgiveness towards someone else. And and God, through his word, he says, if you will forgive others, I will forgive you. And sometimes we forget that. We forget that part about God. We think we're justified in our bad attitude. We think we're justified to hate others. You know, people can be really hurtful. And we can experience bad situations. I remember meeting a woman years ago uh, uh, who her daughter was killed. And she testified to me that she went into the prison 10 years afterwards and forgave her daughter's killer. And through that act, that one act of forgiveness, he gave his life to the Lord. And so we don't understand the power in forgiveness and we when we under we understand it when we first get saved because we understand we're forgiven right what we don't understand is that when god looks at us he wants us then to forgive others to pass that blessing forward yeah and when we do you know all that bitterness just melts away and so I, I like First John. That's really that's uh, that's really important. The other if, if favorite character I love Amos. I mean, I just love Amos. I love he says, "I'm not a prophet, and I'm not even a son of a prophet." But I'm going to tell you what God said. Mm-hmm. <laughs> and you know, as he's going forth and he's he's speaking to the 
priests of all of Israel. And he's, he's, he's really letting them know God sees what you're doing. And, you know, sometimes I think about that in our churches today, in our leadership and, and ministers. God calls us all to a higher standard. He doesn't let us off the hook. He, you know, he says, if your teacher, you're held to a higher standard. I remember when he first called me as, as a teacher, I said, God, I'll, I don't want to be a teacher because I don't want to be held to a higher standard. Yeah. And then what did he call me to do? A teacher. <laughs> So in other words, you know, Amos points out to the priests of Israel, to the leaders, because that's who God holds most accountable. You and I as leaders, we're held to the highest standard. And I love how bold he was that he went forth what could have cost him his life. And, you know, today's society says we have to have that business card you know, to be somebody. We have to, we have to have a title to be somebody. And Amos said, mm -mm, I'm not a prophet. I'm not even a son of a prophet, but I'm going to tell you what my father said to me about what, what's coming your way. And because of the sins in the sanctuary, because of the sins that you've committed, not only you, but your whole family, your whole family is going to suffer from what you've done. And I, I, I love that because He's bold enough, even to the point of costing him his own life to go forward because he understood the importance of godly leadership. Yeah. And that's a powerful, powerful message. Wow. Yeah, for sure. Yeah, I love that. Um, what about a uh, favorite verse? Uh, he whom the sun sets free is free indeed. <laughs> and I love that. That's uh, John uh, 838, I believe. <laughs> because you know what? When Jesus sets you free, you're truly free indeed. Now, that's not to say you don't have some things you have to overcome because Revelation 3 lets us know that when we make it, when we listen to God, we are overcomers. Right. And that's what we're called to be overcomers. Yeah. And, and but J Jesus has already done the work, in other words, he's done all he needs to do. Yeah. Amen. Now it's up to you and I to believe the truth and to act upon the truth. And to transform our, our thinking in the truth. And when we do those things, all of then we're, then we're totally free. Amen. But he's given us everything we need to be free today. Amen. Wow. That's, that's incredible. Um, let's move on. These are just um, personal questions. So favorite music, uh, books, uh, movies, and TV shows. Okay, there's a movie out right now that's called Beyond the Wrath, which if you have not, have you seen it? Before the Wrath? Before the Wrath, I, yes. literally, I literally finished watching that this morning. Oh, I, I kid you not. I started watching it last night. I fell asleep watching it last night and finished it this morning. That's exciting. Yeah. <laughs> yes. This, this podcast was meant to be. <laughs> Wow. Is that not, a, it's, a, it's phenomenal. And I would really recommend every believer, listen, go listen. Jan Markle is one of my favorites. I mean, I just love her. I love her radio show and she's really powerful. If you have not seen Olive Tree Ministries is another really important ministry to keep your eyes on because she has the Jewish roots uh, and Christianity, and she, she does such a beautiful job about tying in current events and what's going on in the world today with, with biblical um, principles. So, so you, you are just overwhelmed and amazed. And I love, I love that whole movie because right now it's like we can almost hear the trumpet sound. Yeah, absolutely. And so time is short <laughs> and we have got to share Jesus as much as we can everywhere that we can, because the word of God says, if you believe in your heart and you confess with your mouth, you will be saved. 
Amen. And so there's no magic potion. There's no, you know, there's no perfect prayer. There's no, yeah. there's no, it's just a simple believe in your heart, confess with your mouth and you will be saved. Amen. Jesus is Lord. And so we've got to share the message of the gospel. We've got to let people know that Jesus loves them, that no matter what they've done, no matter what their past looks like, no matter what sins they've committed, Jesus died on that cross. And the word of God says that he wiped away every accusation that stood against you and I when we say yes to him. And I'm telling you what, that frees me up, Samuel. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. That brings freedom to me. All that guilt, all that shame, all that disappointment, it just leaves you when you understand that Jesus just wiped it all away. Yeah, and then he empowers us with his spirit to to, to walk in that and, and do his will. So what what incredible love. Um what about uh, music and books? Favorite. Music, uh, Waymaker is my favorite song. I could listen to it um, 20 times a day and still want more. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> and years ago, I read um, Pilgrim's uh, Progress. And I think it's a really great, great, you know, it's, it's a classic. Yeah. It's been around forever and it's, it's, you know, it's, it's a very popular book, but what I love about it is when you read it, you really start to get a better picture of light and dark kingdom of good and kingdom of evil. And you, you really start, it really starts to open your eyes to the demonic, to the spiritual realm and to uh, just this pro this path that we're on as we walk through, we have to understand we have a real enemy and that is Satan. He comes to kill, steal, and destroy. Jesus Christ came to give life and life more abundantly. And you pick and choose who are you going to serve. And every day we have to make that decision in, in everything that we do. I mean, once we're saved, we're saved. But we still have to make a decision of how we're going to live our life. Yeah. And that's why, that's why I wrote the book, No Regrets, because if we want to honor God, We'll have a life of no regrets. Yeah, amen. Yeah, that that, that that's going to be on my list of of reads, my long list of reads, because I'm um, going through Steve uh, Cleary. I believe his name. He did uh, an animated series called I Bible. Um, his uh, website's RevelationMedia.com. He's he actually did a, a movie on P Pilgrim's Progress, which I, I haven't seen, but the animated. Um, uh, Bible series is, is just incredible. Um, I'm going through that with, with my daughter right now. And so, um, you know, that that's on my list of movies to watch. And uh, so, yeah, uh, let's see. What do you like to do in your free time? <laughs> oh, goodness. Um, well, you know, free time, I don't have a lot of, <laughs> but I love to play the piano. Um, I love, I want to paint. I love painting. Hmm. My father was a painter. I, I, I'm a wannabe hmm. uh, at both on both accounts there, but I like to do that. I also like to spend time with friends and family. I love to serve. Um, cooking is a hobby that I love. So I like to have lots of company and I'm going to have some company this week coming. So it's, it's going to be a busy week for me, but uh, cooking is, is a, a, a real hobby and love that I have. Awesome. Uh, so that leads to the next question, which is if you could have dinner with five people dead or alive, who would they be? Well, if I didn't say Jesus, I'd have to be crazy because that'd be number one. Okay. Four more. <laughs> um, let's see, you know, I, Apostle Paul, I mean, if you're talking about uh, how if, uh, one person can influence your life, Apostle Paul, to me, is just phenomenal and i would have to say oh, he would be number two um uh, again i think uh, if it were a biblical a, another biblical person of course would be amos because i relate so well to amos i just love amos um if you're talking about people in history um that, that, you know, I have a whole lot less, uh, that's on my short list. I can't really, 
Yeah. Oh, I can't really think of someone that I might be overwhelmed uh, to to um, to set down with. Um, right off the top of my head, I can't think of someone else that I would absolutely have to. Okay. But anyway, that's that's a that's three that I definitely okay. would. You got three, okay, all right. Um, so if you'll close this out in prayer. Um, we'll conclude shortly after okay i would be happy to do that i would be happy to heavenly father we just come before you gracious king and we thank you and we thank you that you father offer life you father give us a reason to live god you give us purpose and destiny and you give us hope you give us direction, but you give us peace, and you give us love. And Father, as Samuel and I come before you today, gracious King, we pray that everyone that hears this broadcast will in some way be ministered to. In some way, their hearts will be transformed, their bodies healed, their minds healed. Touch each and every listener, God. We ask you, precious King, that your blessings be upon us. That as we move out to speak your word, we speak it with boldness. That we have a heart and compassion of Christ. To see people healed and delivered and restored. Bless your people this day. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Amen. Well, Robin, I, I absolutely cannot thank you enough. Uh, it's just been truly, truly such a, a pleasure talking with you. Um, you know, reading your book, as, as I mentioned before, highly recommend that to, to, to the listener. You know, if you if you were impacted by in anything you hear today, um, I, I can guarantee you, uh, you're going to want to pick up the book because uh, as I as I read through that, and we, we only just kind of scratched the surface on, on what's in the book. Um, there's so many points throughout where I had to kind of pause and take a second and, and pray and, and think. Um, and, uh, and, and you, you, you make room for that in the book at the end of each chapter where you, you ask questions and you have those quotes in the scriptures throughout. And so, um, uh, so yeah, thank you. Thank you for that really. Um, and I'll, you know, I can divulge later on, on more on, 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 on how, you know, reading through that book helped me, but I'll, I'll definitely keep in touch and let you know 30 days from now, Thank you. Finish with this love challenge and, and, and how much, um, you know, uh, you know, uh, what the, what the outcome of that is. Um, and, um, so before we leave, tell people how to get the book and how to get in touch with you and your ministry. Sure. Okay. Um, Robin Bertram TV, um, is my website. You can go there and visit the website. You can get the book on any of the major bookstores. You can go to charisma. You can get it, uh, uh, books a million um uh barnes and noble uh it was on walmart books and target i'm not sure i think you can still get it there too yeah. um so you can also uh connect with me on facebook robin bertram uh official robin bertram on facebook or my my regular profile robin bertram i'd love that I'm also on uh, Instagram. You can connect with me there. Um, so I'm not quite as active on social media as I have been in the past, just because we have been in transition. We've been moving across the country. So finally, we're getting to uh, back to stability. So you'll see me there quite, uh, quite a bit coming up. Cool. Awesome. Um, well, thank you so much. I'll, I'll keep in touch, you know, maybe down the road and I can have you back on. Um, I love, uh, love our conversation today. Um, and, uh, I'll, I'll, I'll see you soon. Thank you so much, Samuel. It was an, it was an honor to be with you today. Thank you. There you have it, ladies and gentlemen. Hope you enjoyed. If you did share with somebody, leave us a rating and review. That's a great way to get the podcast out there. Like, and subscribe. And with that being said, we'll catch you on the next one.